Hello everyone. So today we'll finish um, the, the classes on macro and uh, we'll start the foundation of economics. So I, I think I, I'm going to skip this slide um, or, or maybe cover it very briefly. So Paul Romer is a Nobel Prize. So the, the next slide is about him. And he wrote in 2016 a paper that's called The Trouble with Macroeconomics, where he harshly criticizes uh, the development of macroeconomists in the last uh, 40 years. Um, he even calls it uh, pseudoscience. Um, and uh, he says uh, the, the, the shocks in the DSG models are imaginary, they don't measure uh, anything real, and then uh, he makes fun of it by replacing uh, the, the shocks in a, in a sentence of an economic paper by gremlin and trolls, and it gives uh, inflation development are mostly driven by the gremlin price markup shocks in the short run and the trolls wage markup shocks in the long run. And um, I mean, his critiques uh, is not uh, only uh, funny, he also has uh, good arguments against um, uh, DSG models. Uh, the issue is that it doesn't propose a, a solution uh, to overcome the limitations. Um, and I wanted to put this slide just to show uh, the, the limitation of these models uh, precisely, that even a Nobel Prize uh, macroeconomist uh, criticizes uh, the state-of-the-art models. But uh, in a sense, um, we still have, uh, despite all the, this uh, limitation that everyone is aware of, um, there is still a, a consensus uh, in many questions about macroeconomists, which means that uh, they know something, that uh, it's, it's not uh, uh, all for nothing. Uh, an example um, is um, that uh, only 5% of macroeconomists that have been surveyed uh, thought that the recovery plan of Obama in 2009 uh, was, uh, was a bad idea. Uh, so most economists agree that it made sense to stimulate the economy uh, through, um, through higher deficit. Uh, in the 5% of economists who disagree, there are still some Nobel Prize, some, for example, uh, uh, Edward Prescott and, and two others. Um, so, so it means that uh, we haven't reached a, a, a stage uh, where uh, we have a model uh, on which everyone agrees and there is no disagreement, but there is still a very high consensus, uh, if not absolute consensus, in, the, in important questions. Okay, so what, why is, um, what is Paul Romer famous for? For engine endogenous growth theory. So we've seen a few sessions ago models uh, that explain growth by an exogenous uh, trend in uh, labor productivity, uh, an exogenous growth in, uh, in productivity. And uh, what Paul Romer at and others did in the in the 80s and 90s is to endogenize uh, this growth in productivity and interpret it as uh, knowledge, basically. So a precursor is uh, Frankel in 62, uh, who introduces a very simple model that is called the AK model because it just writes as uh, the production is equal to a constant A times capital K and uh, capital accumulates indefinitely. So th there is no um, decreasing return to capital, like uh, in a Cobb douglas uh, production function that have been used in uh, other growth models by Solo and uh, Cass Koopman. Uh, here, uh, you can, um, yeah, you, you can always accumulate capital and, and grow, and the, the economy grows forever. And we don't know really why is it so, but an interpretation is that uh, there is an increasing knowledge that offsets the decreasing returns to capital. Um, Paul Romer used this model and extended it uh, by endogenizing savings so, and, and explicitly modeling uh, knowledge. But he's more famous for um, another paper uh, four years later where he models uh, innovation as an optimal choice um, 
of, uh, of agents. And so here is the production function he introduces. You have um, the output, which is equal to the labor in uh, manufacturing, Ly, with decreasing return, times um, a composite capital good, which is composed of A different goods, Xi. And this A grows endogenously. So the, gr the growth in innovation is modeled by a growth in product uh, var variety, in product differentiation. And um, the reason why having a larger A produces more is because for a given uh, sum of, uh, of Xi, so for a given uh, amount of capital, having more capital goods means that Xi will be lower for each uh, type of capital good. And because it enters the production function with decreasing return, it's Xi to the power alpha, with alpha below one, then uh, it has a higher marginal uh, productivity. Um, so each, each capital good has a higher marginal productivity when there is a more, when there are more capital goods, more different uh, types. And uh, how does this A uh, grow? Uh, well, it grows with uh, research and development. And research and development is produced by uh, labor, by a specific type of labor. And so you have uh, the total labor L, which is divided between research and development labor LR and manufacturing labor LY. And the amount of uh, R&D, LR, is optimized in, in the sense that uh, each worker uh, chooses optimally uh, whether to work in research or in manufacturing, depending on where it is the more productive. And so as long as increasing uh, the A um, is a, as higher return than uh, increasing the labor force in manufacturing, uh, people uh, enter the labor force in research and development and increase innovation. And uh, there are different policy conclusions as uh, in uh, classical models of growth with this model. Because knowledge, so A, is a non-rival good. What does it mean to be a non-rival good? It means that it can be consumed without uh, harming others. It, it can, it's, it can be, um, it can benefit uh, some users of, uh, of it uh, while still uh, being used by others. So when you have um, a pie and, uh, and you are uh, two persons, uh, you have to divide the pie into two to uh, benefit from it. But if you have a, a theorem or a patent uh, or any knowledge, both of you can use the knowledge at the same time. And it can actually uh, even increase your utility to be two instead of one uh, because of a uh, network effect. Because uh, if you're two, maybe one of the two will have a, a new idea and the other one can benefit from it. Um, so because knowledge is a, a non-rival good, it means that um, part of uh, the benefits of new knowledge, part of the benefit of innovation, cannot um, be appropriated by uh, the inventor. Because uh, when you invent uh, something, even if it's patented, you cannot uh, exploit all the profit from uh, inventing it uh, because at some point it can be used freely by any member of society. Think of uh, Pythagoras, uh, he couldn't uh, earn all the, the benefit from um, discovering uh, this theorem uh, because uh, benefits are, are still um, uh, ongoing right now and, and of course he cannot benefit from this wealth. And um, this means that there will be underinvestment in research because a private company, okay, imagine that this is the private return to, um, to innovation and this is the total return for society. So if I uh, invent a, a new 
feature for a telephone, say, uh, I'm going to, to be able to, to, to appropriate the benefit from it for 10 years. So this is my private profit. But afterwards, uh, my competitors uh, can use it because the patent is no longer uh, valid. And uh, the benefit will still accrue to society a larger benefit. So a private firm will only invest this amount into uh, innovation, although society as a whole would like to invest all this amount, right? Because uh, the amount of investment, uh, according to the theory, will equate the returns of an investment. This means that there is underinvestment in research if research is left to uh, private uh, forces. And so research and development should be subsidized. Another consequence is that uh, the different markets, different countries should be integrated so that knowledge is shared. There are other um, big names in this literature, uh, for example, Aguillon and Howitt, who model innovation in a different way. Instead of uh, modeling it as um, <coughs> the invention of new product, they model it as an improvement of an, an existing product, and they take the number of product as fixed. This is called the Schumpeterian uh, growth theory, because Schumpeter in the 40s uh, described uh, innovation as a creative destruction process. Now, if there isn't any question, I'll change the, completely the topic and talk about James Tobin. So James Tobin was a, a neo-Canadian, so he's, a, he's an old economist from the 50s, 60s, 70s. And uh, his contributions um, relate to finance. He developed a portfolio theory, which is the theory that explains uh, where you should invest, um, how you should uh, distribute your, your savings into different uh, kinds of assets. So his first, con his first contribution is to explain the liquidity preference uh, of Canadian theory by a much simpler idea than uh, that of Keynes. It is to view mo money as an asset with no research, no return, as n and no risk. Because the basics of uh, portfolio theory is that you should invest in, um, in assets that reflect the level of risk that uh, you are willing to bear. And in general, the more risky the asset, the higher the expected return. So because you are willing to take more risk, uh, that is to accept a larger uh, variance in the possible return, you will be remunerated by uh, higher expected returns. And uh, another result in portfolio theory is that um, you only need to have two assets uh, in, in, I mean, in the, in the most basic model where there is just risk and expected return and it's unidimensional, you only need to have two assets uh, to, uh, to have a balanced portfolio. One asset has uh, no return and no risk and for Tobin, money is a perfect example. And another asset will be very risky and with very high expected return. And the proportion of the two assets that you own uh, reflects your risk preference. I'm going to close that door. Um, oops. So, yes, and then uh, Tobin is also well known for uh, his answer to uh, the following question. When a company wants to expand, should it invest in new capital or buy a competitor? So say you're, you're a big firm and uh, yeah, you, you want to expand. Uh, should you uh, buy a, a, build a new plant, hire workers, uh, buy patents, or simply uh, buy your competitor, uh, buy the shares uh, of your competitor in the, shop, in the stock market? Well, the answer, of course, is uh, to, to choose the cheapest option. 
and uh, to know which one is the cheapest, we'll compare the replacement value of the competitor, which is the cost of building uh, the, the, the plants that are equivalent to their plant, to hire the, the same kind of workers, the, to buy the, the patents, or the market value of the stock market of your competitor. Okay? And um, introduced an indicator, uh, Tobin's Q, which is the ratio of the market value of a firm to the book value, or book value is another name for the replacement cost. So when the market value is higher than the book value, if the, 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 the stocks uh, is valued more by the market, then uh, you should better invest than buy your competitor, and vice versa. Uh, this concept was, was already introduced by Caldor and Pesnetti, but uh, Tobin uh, popularized it. And it gave uh, a link between Keynesianism and, um, I mean, in Keynesianism, between uh, the financial uh, markets and the goods markets, which explains the investment rate. Because take the Tobin skew for the economy as a whole. If um, the market is uh, undervalued, if the, the stock market uh, is low, then Q is below one, and the firms should rather buy their competitors than invest themselves. And in this situation, there will be a lot of mergers and acquisitions instead of investment, which according to Keynesian theory uh, leads to a recession. So this is a link between the price uh, in the stock markets and, uh, the, and recessions. The levels in the stock market and the level of output. Now, Tobin is famous for um, what is known as the Tobin tax. So the Tobin tax has been proposed by Tobin as a, as a small tax on every transaction in the currency market. The currency markets are huge markets where every day uh, lots of currencies are exchanged uh, against another. And there are two reasons uh, for exchanging currencies. Um, the, the, the fir I mean, of course, y there is the reason when uh, you, you buy some good abroad and, and you need the, the, the currency um, of, uh, of, of, of the foreign currency. But what is traded in these markets are um, options or uh, rather um, exchange uh, rates, exchange rate uh, swaps. That is, a contract that, that says uh, that both parties commit to exchange their currencies at a given date in the future, say one year uh, from now, at a given price. And the reason why uh, people do that is that, say, you are a Swiss firm and uh, you, 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 I mean, you, you need uh, some um, uh, Chinese uh, product. Um, and uh, you will be, uh, I mean, you need to order them now uh, to, pl to plan to buy, you plan to buy some Chinese product in one year from now, uh, where you will, uh, when you will uh, produce uh, your stuff. Uh, but it's right now that uh, you sign the contract with uh, your uh, customers that uh, in two years from now, you will deliver them, I don't know, wind panel or whatever. And uh, the thing is that uh, you are unsure of the exchange rate one year from now when you will need to buy uh, the, the Chinese goods. And to uh, insure yourself against um, exchange rate uh, movements, uh, you will buy it uh, right now. I mean, you will not buy the good right now, but you will uh, buy the, um, the currency somehow right now using this type of contract. Uh, so that you, you are sure that the, the exchange rate remains the same. And the thing is, this uh, allows for speculation. And uh, indeed, the bulk of exchanges in this market are purely speculative. Uh, it's uh, traders, uh, institution, financial institutions, that uh, foresees that uh, the prices, uh, the, the exchange rates will go up or down and uh, buy uh, or sell uh, currencies accordingly. 
And this can destabilize uh, the, the value of, of currencies uh, and uh, destabilize the monetary system of certain countries, uh, especially given that um, there are some herding behavior uh, or even coordinated attacks uh, against a given currency. It happened uh, in the 90s uh, against the, the English uh, pound and against the Italian lira. That's uh, how uh, George Soros became uh, very rich um, because uh, he, bet, he betted against uh, the, these currencies and, uh, and, and he had um, so much market power that uh, he could indeed uh, trigger uh, by himself a, a devaluation of this currency. And, um, so to avoid uh, these, these crises, uh, this currency crisis that have no uh, real basis, uh, Tobin proposed a tax on uh, every transaction to reduce um, specula speculation in these markets. And uh, this idea was um, um, reused by uh, after Glo globalization group uh, which initiated in France uh, but uh, but now uh, spread out uh, over the world attack and uh, they were uh, almost successful in having this tax implementing in the EU Parliament only six votes uh, were missing their plan was to to have um, a tax broader than a tax on currency markets. They wanted a financial tax, a financial transaction tax, so on every uh, financial transaction, like stock markets, bonds, uh, etc. And the, their plan was to use uh, the, the, the revenues raised that they estimated to about 1% of European GDP to uh, fund uh, international aid. Um, but uh, this was not the, the, intent, the original intention of, uh, of Tobin. Uh, he warned that the, the, the reason for his tax was to avoid speculation, not to finance uh, foreign aid, even if he's in favor of financing foreign aid, uh, he thinks it is not necessarily the, the best mean to do so. And uh, he was not very happy uh, to, that, uh, that his name is associated with an uh, anti-globalization um, association because he's a free trader. Any question on this? Yes? Um, why, why does speculation lead to crisis? Why does speculation lead to crisis? Because, um, so in the case of, uh, of um, okay, do you, do you understand w w why speculation uh, can lead to uh, big movement in, in, uh, in exchange rates? And, uh, and, and um, a big depreciation, as a devaluation, it's depreciation of, uh, of, the, of the currency sometimes? No? Okay. So, um, so say um, you, um, um, yes, so the, the currencies are, are traded, and um, with, with these uh, contracts, uh, that uh, allow one to, to buy uh, currencies at a given uh, price in future period, you can uh, bet on the fact that uh, the, the price of, say, the, 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 the English pound will be lower in one year from now. And um, so what you do is you... Um, you you sell uh, you 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 borrow money. Um, you borrow uh, you borrow uh, English pounds. You sell them, and uh, in one year from now, you buy them for half the price. And then you pay back uh, the the guy from from whom you borrowed. In so doing, you you earn money. Because you, if you, you were successful in uh, foreseeing that there would be a, a, decrease, a depreciation of the English pound. And uh, if you put uh, a lot of money um, into, into this scheme, it means that uh, there will be a lot of uh, English pound sold right now. 
which will have the effect to actually depreciate the English pound. So it's some kind of uh, self-fulfilling prophecy. And, um, and so if you have, uh, if you have uh, access to huge resources, uh, like uh, if you're a bank, or uh, you can play with it and, uh, and actually uh, manipulate the, the, the exchange rates and, um, and make money out of it. And, uh, and why does it trigger a crisis? Because then uh, the value of uh, the money of, of the UK uh, depreciates um, a lot, by a lot, and this can be detrimental to the economy of, uh, of the UK because uh, they did not intend to, to, to devaluate their currency at this time. And this means that they lose some purchasing power because their currency uh, is worth less uh, than, than, than before the speculative attack. I, is it clear? Yep. Great. Yes? What was the like, response of the economic community on, on this idea with uh, this small tax on transactions? What is the response of the economic uh, community? I think uh, people uh, approve of this idea. Uh, I mean, there are probably critiques because there are always is, but um, or maybe maybe the critique is that it wouldn't work. That uh, they, but uh, but I think in general people agree that uh, it would be a good idea. Uh, but I'm not. Uh, yeah, you, you could check uh, if you, if you're interested. I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, but that's for the, the, the tax on currency markets, for financial, uh, because now when we discuss the Tobin tax, people have in mind actually a tax on uh, all financial transaction. And here there is, there is more of a debate. Uh, the debate is um, between those who think uh, it's important to, to reduce speculation, uh, because speculation uh, is um, a, a, an unfair way to uh, enrich some people. It, uh, it enriches some people and, uh, and um, the contrary, it makes some people poor for no reason. Um, it's also uh, a waste of resource because a lot of uh, intelligent uh, worker will uh, become trader uh, for no social benefit instead of, uh, I don't know, being doctors. Um, and there are uh, the other side that says that uh, speculation uh, is good because uh, it brings liquidity to the market because it's by exploiting the, um, the, arbitrary, the, the, the arbitrage uh, conditions uh, that uh, speculators bring uh, liquidity to the market and so make markets smooth, work smoothly. And then there are counter arguments that uh, actually uh, in, in, in times of crisis, when we need the liquidity the most, uh, then uh, everyone had the same behavior, so there is no liquidity anymore. And uh, so, yeah, I, I, I'm not expert in these debates, but uh, yeah, it's hugely debated. Um, then uh, Robert Mondel uh, worked on, again, uh, another topic. So today I'm, I'm exploring uh, macroeconomics, not uh, as I did in the, the last three sessions, uh, where I, I talked about the, the main macroeconomic models that address uh, macroeconomy as a whole in general equilibrium model. Today we're, we're going specific uh, subdomain of macro that have their own theories. And here it's about um, exchange rates and uh, optimal currency areas. So Mundell is known for the Mundell Fleming model, which extends uh, Keynesian theory to an open economy, while uh, Keynesian theory was described for a closed economy. So an open economy, it's an economy that trades with uh, foreign countries. And uh, Mundell observed a triangle of impossibility uh, in the instruments that a government can choose. And a government cannot, uh, at the same time, uh, have a free movement of capital in and out of the country. Uh, the control of the interest rate and the control of the exchange rate. So, um, <coughs> 
because if uh, you have um, if you want to control say your your interest rates and uh, have a fixed uh, exchange rate um, no sorry uh, in what sense is it uh, the, the easier to to explain Yeah, okay. Imagine you want to control the interest rates and to have uh, free uh, capital flows. And uh, um, imagine you want to decrease the, the interest rate below the, the foreign interest rate, be, below the global interest rate. You want to decrease the interest rate to simulate the economy, for example. Then, if you have a fixed uh, exchange rate, uh, capital will, f will flow um, from your country to the foreign countries where there are, there are higher yields uh, to uh, bonds. So, uh, so you, you need to, to, to let uh, capital flow. And uh, if you, you, you don't uh, let uh, capital out of the country, then uh, you, your money will depreciate. If it doesn't, I mean, if you want to keep the exchange rate fixed, you will have to um, sell reserves you have uh, in other currencies, but you cannot do that indefinitely because you have a finite amount of, of reserves in other currency. Um, so in the time where uh, Mundell uh, was writing, the um, the norm, the the the, the, the international uh, monetary system uh, was one with fixed exchange rates, uh, not really free capital flows, and uh, and where interest rates uh, were set by the central bank. And nowadays, uh, capital flow freely, uh, but exchange rates are floating. And so. Um, under floating exchange rate, we often say that lowering the interest rate will depreciate uh, the currency. That's always the case for the reason uh, um, I explained. Because uh, if you if you lower um, the, the the interest rate. Um, it means that uh, capital will flow out of your country and, uh, and so this will uh, depreciate the currency. And um, under a... Yes? Uh, how do you control capital flows? How do you control capital flows? Um, what you could do is... Um, so there are some governments that control the capital flows, like uh, Cuba, Venezuela, uh, uh, so some governments uh, did it, uh, even non-socialist uh, countries at various uh, periods. And, uh, and the way you can do it is um, by uh, providing a token to people, to firms uh, who want to import goods. Okay, no, that's for, uh, sorry, that's for uh, controlling, yeah, that's for controlling the, the inflow of, of uh, capital in the form of, of goods. Uh, you can probably do the same uh, if it's uh, in uh, in form of uh, of um, uh, finance uh, of uh, uh, in abstract form, uh, non tangible form, you can um, yes. So so yeah, you can simply um, allow uh, certain firms to uh, to to. Uh, or, or say mm -hmm. allow a certain amount for each bank or each uh, firm uh, to, to, to trade with the other countries or uh, to, to, to have a, limit the, the transaction, have a transaction feeling, ceiling for, for each uh, entity. Or you can uh, tax uh, the capital uh, flows. Taxing would be uh, halfway between totally free or uh, totally uh, not free uh, capital flow. You could uh, tax um, people who want to invest in your country, for example. This is, uh, this is something that has been uh, proposed uh, following the, the Asian crisis in, in, the, in the end of the 90s. 
uh, there was a, a crisis in, in various uh, Asian countries because uh, suddenly uh, many f Western investors uh, withdrew their, their capital from these countries. Um, and, uh, and so these, country, uh, these countries, uh, the, the banks in these countries uh, were lacking uh, liquidity uh, and, and uh, a way to prevent that would be to, to tax uh, firms that invest in your country uh, in the first place. So you accumulate some kind of reserve and uh, when they want to, to go back, uh, you, you have this reserve uh, to, to help you. Uh, another way is to, to tax them when they, when they go out, when there is an outflow. Um, yeah. You can't stop them from doing it. You can just make it very expensive. You can, no, I mean, this is the, the modern way to do it is uh, through taxation uh, because it's uh, probably more uh, easy to, to monitor uh, tax than, uh, than just a uh, strict um, um, Interdiction, but in principle, you can just. Um, I think Ch China does it or, or did it in the past. They, they approve, uh, the, the, the authorities uh, approve or reject any demand uh, from a firm to invest in China uh, or to buy a Chinese firm uh, or to buy Chinese stock. Or, uh, or they could do the same for selling. Um, because also, the, the, the um, yeah. yeah, I think this is the way to do it, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, so lowering the interest rate will depreciate the currency and under a condition that is called the uh, Marsh, uh, Marshall Lerner condition uh, that is uh, generally observed this will stimulate exports. Uh, why, uh, so what does this condition say? So when your currency depreciates, <coughs> this means that your currency has uh, less value. So um, the price of your export will increase and, no, sorry, the, the price of your import will increase and the price of your exports, the cost of your, uh, the price of your uh, export will decrease and the price of your imports will increase. This has uh, two effects. The first is that uh, you will spend more, uh, so you, you will need more uh, foreign currency. Uh, so in, in, uh, in, in uh, money amounts, uh, you will uh, import more uh, because imports are more expensive. But the second effect is a substitution effect. Because uh, imports uh, are becoming more expensive and exports cheaper, then you will import more and, uh, uh, sorry, import less and export more. And the marshall lenner condition uh, says that the second effect, the substitution effect, will dominate the, the first effect. And uh, this is generally true. And uh, at least in the medium run, maybe in the short run, uh, when the, your currency depreciates, uh, you will, uh, your, your trade balance uh, will, uh, will go negative, but in the long run, uh, you, will, you will have a, a surplus in, in your trade balance, or in, it will go in the direction of a surplus. Um, so this, under this model, uh, we see that monetary policy, so the, the fact to manipulate the interest rate, uh, works under floating exchange rate, that it is what I've just explained, to stimulate, to stimulate exports and hence uh, national production. And uh, Mondel also shows that uh, under fixed exchange rate, um, it's the fiscal policy that works. And so he has a, a very uh, caricatural model where only one type of policy works in only one type of exchange rate regime. This is because he makes strong assumption in his model, there is no expectation. This was uh, addressed by one of his students, Dorn Bush, uh, which finds then um, more, um, more subtle uh, conclusions. And there are other uh, assumptions, and actually James Tobin showed in his novel lecture that by changing uh, one assumption, one would uh, reverse uh, Mandel's conclusion. So this model is not uh, really believed uh, 
anymore. Mendel is also well known for his study of uh, what constitutes an optimum currency area. And um, actually is the first to have uh, asked the question, uh, who should share the same money? Uh, here we are in Switzerland, we don't have the euro. Should the, the, Swiss, uh, the Switzerland adopt the euro currency? Uh, should Europe, the European Union, uh, should they have adopted the euro in the first place? What is the optimal area for uh, common currency? So uh, we need to, to understand the, the benefit and the cost of uh, a common currency area. The benefit is that it promotes trade uh, between the subregion, and, uh, and trade uh, improves uh, efficiency. The cost is that uh, each uh, region loses their monetary sovereignty. It means that uh, uh, if Italy uh, wants to decrease the interest rate, uh, it cannot unless uh, Germany agrees. And uh, if there is not the, the same economic condition in Italy and in Germany, uh, then the, the, the solution cannot be uh, adapted to each country. The area can still be um, optimal if the, um, um, the stabilization or the, 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 uh, of the economy can go through other means than the monetary policy. And uh, there are two uh, very important means. The first is mobility of labor and capital, so mobility of the factors of production. So if there is high unemployment in Italy and low unemployment in Germany, uh, and uh, Italy can, can, instead of uh, lowering the interest rate to stimulate their economy, uh, you could say uh, Italian workers can uh, move to Germany, uh, and uh, so this will equalize unemployment in both countries. Um, the second way is to have fiscal uh, tax integration or solidarity between the region. So when there is a higher unemployment in, in Italy than Germany, then German, uh, Germany will, will transfer money to Italy. Um, and you see that this is not really the case in the European Union. There is no uh, perfect labor mobility, uh, if only because uh, people don't speak, don't speak the same language. And uh, there is uh, almost no solidarity uh, between regions in the European Union. There is no common uh, economic policy. There is no common budget. So, uh, according to, uh, to the theory, the EU is not an optimal uh, currency area and it shouldn't have uh, a common currency. What is, uh, or, or said differently, uh, the, the, the EU uh, can have a common currency, but then it will need a common economic policy. It will need uh, an harmonization, uh, a coordination of the economic policies uh, at the European level. And um, ironically, uh, even if uh, his theory says that uh, uh, the EU is not an optimal currency area, Mandel was uh, very in favor of the EU and so much that uh, he's called the father of the, of the euro. Because uh, actually he he took another path uh, away from his original model in his uh, ideas. He's a supply-sider economist, uh, which means uh, he supports the, the, the kind of uh, economic policy of uh, Reagan and Thatcher than, um, that, uh, that stimulating demand will have uh, no uh, good effect, and, uh, and that um, the, the government should be, the, the public sector should be as small as possible. And uh, with this idea uh, that uh, the, the market uh, always reaches the, the efficient uh, uh, prices, there should be the, the low of one price at the global level, which means uh, one product should have the, the same price uh, in, in every country. And then if um, a country, uh, if the currency of a country depreciates, 
it will have no effect on the price of uh, its exports uh, because of the law of one price. This will just create inflation in this country. Um, so, uh, because monetary policy is ineffective in any case, there is no, um, uh, there is no uh, cost exactly to have a common currency. So, uh, the common currency, the, 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 the currency area should be as wide as possible, and Mondel was advocating for a global uh, common currency. Uh, actually, uh, his own student showed that uh, his premise is, is wrong uh, and that uh, monetary policy uh, has an effect uh, on the depreciation of the currency and on exports. Yes. Is there any question? Um, no. Okay. And I'll conclude um, this series on macro with uh, Paul Krugman, um, who is uh, known for studying the, the effect or the hypothesis of increasing returns. Uh, and he actually explains uh, trade by increasing return and uh, product differentiation, a la Dixit and Siglitz. So if you remember the model of monopolistic competition, this is the model he applied to trade. Why? Uh, because conventional trade models um, that we can trace back to Ricardo, uh, rely on comparative advantages to explain for trade. The, the model says that um, if um, Portugal is better at producing uh, Porto uh, than, than uh, the UK, and UK is better at uh, producing, uh, I don't know, uh, sweaters, then uh, they will trade a sweaters for uh, wine. But this model fails to account for most of trade, which occurs between countries of similar um, wealth, similar income level, and between uh, similar sectors. So for example, um, the US will uh, sell uh, Ford and buy Toyota even though uh, both are cars, so and you can think uh, that the, both uh, Japan and the US are equally uh, efficient at producing cars. And the reason why they trade is because there is a taste for variety and uh, there are um, gains from trade because of increasing returns to scale. In the sense that um, in this model you have fixed costs so uh, you want to, to produce more, you want to, you want, if you are a firm, you want to, to, to have the largest market uh, possible to sell your goods. And uh, it's better to, to be open to trade in this case. This uh, gives a counter argument uh, to free trade. Uh, which was uh, the policy recommendation of uh, the comparative advantage model. Because if you have increasing returns to scale, it means that um, you need uh, an initial investment in your uh, industry to make it competitive. And this justify um, protecting what is called infant industry, which is exactly what uh, every um, country that has been successful in industrializing uh, rapidly in the next uh, 100 years did. We can take the example of uh, uh, South Korea, uh, China, Taiwan, uh, all these countries, or, or even Japan, uh, and even to a certain extent uh, European countries, but they did it before. Uh, what they did is select the, the sectors uh, that the country wants to develop, uh, protect uh, these sectors from uh, international competition by putting high tariffs uh, so, so that, um, and by subsidizing research in these sectors, 
by uh, or by uh, by many different measures um, that were protecting this sector from uh, international competition and uh, forced uh, national consumer to buy a product from the country even though they were uh, more expensive or of uh, worse quality than uh, the same products from abroad. And uh, this was effective at uh, creating uh, different type of industries uh, in this country. Uh, and uh, for example, now in Taiwan has the, the monopoly on, uh, on uh, chips. You've, probably read of it, it's a, it's a big issue these days, and, uh, and, uh, and South Korea developed uh, um, a uh, big industry in, uh, in ship uh, building, and uh, all this is um, because um, there was some uh, protection at the beginning of, um, of, the, of, of the growth of, of the country. And it's only when the, the industry is uh, developed enough that uh, it is uh, in the interest of the country to, uh, to have no tariff, no barriers to trade, because now uh, the, in the country's industry is competitive and, uh, uh, and the, the comparative advantage model uh, is, uh, is more um, applicable. Um, what, what I've just said, I take it from uh, a Leon Thief Price uh, winner, um, who is uh, called Hajung? Ha uh, I forgot his name. Something like uh, Hajung Chang, uh, Korean uh, economist, um, who who studied what uh, countries did, uh, successful countries did, and uh, and, and showed the, what, what I just described. Um, Yes, and, uh, and Krugman, yes, and so actually this work uh, from, from Krugman launched a, a new uh, field or a new uh, school of thought uh, in economics, which is the new trade theory. And uh, he went on 10 years later by um, studying the effect of increasing returns on geography. So the idea is to understand why are population uh, concentrated in cities uh, in, 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 uh, in developed in, uh, in high income countries? And so in his model, he endogenizes the location of firms and of the population. And <clears throat> this explains how the country becomes uh, differentiated between industrialized core cities and an agricultural periphery. Uh, the idea is that firms concentrate in cities to minimize transport costs of their goods, from uh, the goods they produce to the customers, um, or between their work, uh, for, from their worker to, to come to, to work. And in so doing, they realize economies of scale and positive externalities in the sense that uh, if a firm locates next to other firms, then it will benefit not only uh, this firm, but also the other firms, uh, which will also benefit from uh, lower transport costs. And um, this is increasing return to the global, uh, to the, to the entire industry level, not to the given, not to the level of the single firm. And this increasing return makes the city as a whole, the core as a whole, more competitive. And uh, because uh, it can produce goods uh, more efficiently, then it, it attracts more and more firms, more and more people. And uh, yeah, this is the idea. It also opened up a new field called uh, econ New Economic Geography. And uh, maybe you've already known of Paul Krugman because he's a famous columnist uh, for the New York Times and uh, is one of the, the favorite economists uh, when we ask other economists. Okay, we can do the pause right now, if you have some question. Actually, I have a, a question for you. Uh, can you go to this URL? URL? Uh, 
the the thing is, I, I, I think I won't have time to cover uh, all what I originally planned. And so uh, I want to have your opinion on uh, which, uh, which topics uh, you find the, the most interesting to cover. And uh, I also invite uh, people uh, from Zoom, from abroad, to answer uh, this, uh, this question. So just go to this uh, URL and then um, let me go on it. Then you will have uh, this, uh, this form. Uh, Yeah, so it would it will help me choose um, which topics to, to cover. Yeah, now we can do 10 minutes of pause. Oh, the Zoom is uh, it's not here anymore. I've seen that the, the Zoom was, uh, was closed. Well, how long uh, was the Zoom um, not working? OK, I'm sorry about that. Don't know what happened. Um, I was just saying that um, I'm asking you to, to go on this URL and make this very short uh, poll to help me decide uh, which topic I cover in the, in the last sessions because I think I won't have time to cover all the topics I, I wanted. All right, so now we are um, starting with a totally different topic, uh, foundation of uh, economics. So these are the mathematical foundations that are uh, at the core of everything we do now in economics. And um, yeah. We can trace them back to uh, utilitarianism. So there is a universal tendency of all sentient beings to seek pleasure and avoid pain. And uh, Epicurus is famous to uh, have coined the, I mean, to have talked about this under the term hedonism. But uh, we didn't need uh, Epicurus to, to be hedonist. And uh, here I, I want to. Uh, mentioned that hedonism uh, is uh, often wrongly uh, understood as uh, researching uh, instantaneous pleasure without uh, having uh, in mind the long term. But actually, hedonistic uh, calculation 
is to take into account uh, all the costs and benefits of the pleasure and uh, of, the, um, of the activity and to do it only uh, if it brings an overall benefit. So an hedonist uh, will not uh, uh, become alcoholic, for example. Okay. Um, Jeremy Bentham in the, the 18th century coined the term utility and uh, argued that legislation should aim at maximizing utility, which he defines as the property in any object whereby it tends to produce benefit, advantage, pleasure, good or happiness, or to prevent the happening of mischief, pain, evil or unhappiness to the party whose interest is considered. The last part is very important because this is a very big question uh, until today. Uh, what, is the inter what is the party we consider? What are the beings uh, that we consider when we choose, uh, when we take decisions? Because utilitarianism, it is about decision making. The decision will be uh, the choice that brings the highest utility. And um, a remarkable defense of uh, utilitarianism is by uh, John Stuart Mill in the book Utilitarianism. It's a very short and brilliant book. And uh, here he, he answers the question, uh, who should we consider? He says, all sentient beings. Um, so he's really an ad in advance uh, in his time. I mean, in the 19th century, uh, there was still uh, uh, so, yeah, uh, slavery uh, in many parts of the world. Uh, women uh, have had uh, uh, had, uh, had not the same rights as men, and uh, and he was um, thinking that uh, every human should have the same rights, and even animals uh, should be taken into account. So, um, and he said that uh, what is important is that people in power uh, pursue utilitarianism with giving equal weight to everyone. He says, he says the lay people can focus on their own happiness uh, as long as it doesn't uh, interfere with that of others. Uh, people can just uh, take care of themselves, of their family, it's okay. Uh, but what's important is that those who take decisions for the entire society uh, take everyone into take consideration. But even if he says that uh, people can focus on their own happiness. He says that he argues that uh, utilitarian people will be happier than egoistic people. So utilitarian people are those who, uh, who this is the contrary of selfish. It means that they will take uh, everyone into consideration. And um, he explains that uh, by the, yeah, he, the way he phrased it is the following. Suffering is conquerable, and though a long succession of generations will perish before the conquest is completed, every mind sufficiently intelligent and generous to bear a part will draw a noble enjoyment from the contest itself, which it would not for any selfish indulgence consent to be without. So uh, it's a very nice way uh, to say that uh, if you're intelligent and generous, uh, you, you will feel bad by being selfish. You will try to accomplish uh, yourself uh, through uh, higher goals, which is the happiness of all. And uh, he also um, understands that there is a crucial uh, part, a key uh, element to the happiness of all is uh, the goal people pursue and that this is heavily influenced by education. He says that education and opinion should establish in the mind of every individual an indissoluble association between his, his own happiness and the good of the whole, so that the general good may be in every individual one of the habitual motives of action. Um, by so doing, he, he kind of uh, avoid the contradiction uh, highlighted by another philosopher, Citric, uh, between egoistic hedonism and utilitarianism, so altruism. Uh, that only peculiar beliefs can resolve 
like the belief he wants that everyone has that uh, one's uh, happiness uh, goes with uh, the happiness of all. But this is kind of mystical belief uh, and uh, it's people can, can also think the contrary, that uh, if they have more and people have less, uh, then they will be happier uh, because they enjoy more, uh, I don't know, of cake, you know? Um, <clears throat> okay, and um, just a few years later, uh, economists uh, used this, this idea, and um, Sané Gévance, Karl Menger, and Léon Valras, who are called the marginalists, Put this into equation where utility is an increasing and concave function of uh, income or of uh, the goods that one consumes. Then uh, many uh, economists uh, of that period extended the theory. And in formalizing the theory in mathematical terms, they dropped, the economists dropped some features of utilitarianism. First, they take the utility function as fixed and individual. So uh, here it's every, uh, it's every individual uh, who maximizes uh, their own utility. Uh, so we, it's, it's not the same meaning as utility in the sense uh, that uh, Mill wanted, which is the, the happiness of everyone. And most importantly, economists uh, make the assumption that the UTC function is fixed, that the tastes, the tastes of people are given and fixed, and they even uh, go further and think that the tastes are the same for everyone. And this is in stark contrast with uh, Mill, who uh, highlighted that uh, what is important is precisely to change the preferences of people through education so that people have tastes that are compatible uh, with each other uh, and that uh, make everyone happier. The economists say, uh, no, people are selfish, they focus on consumption and they assume non-satiation, which means that the UTT is always increasing. Um, there, is no, uh, there is no ceiling in, in the UT level, utility level. Um, when I'm saying economist, is the, the mainstream uh, theories. It's uh, some, some uh, departed from this assumption, but uh, the norm is to make these assumptions. And uh, another norm that uh, became uh, adopted in the early 20th century is that um, Individual utilities cannot be compared. This is a philosophical uh, view that we cannot really know what's happening uh, within uh, the minds of people, and so we cannot really compare the pleasure uh, that two people get from the same activity, from the same consumption. The only thing we can know is whether uh, this individual prefers A to B and whether this individual prefers A to B. But we don't know whether this individual enjoys more pleasure uh, with A than this uh, individual. Uh, or we don't want to make assumption on this, actually. So all that matters is the underlying preferences between bundles what we call the ordinality, so the way people rank the alternatives, and not the cardinality, not the numbers that we could attach to them. And um, the model that uh, we use uh, right now to, in economics has been developed by uh, von Neumann and uh, Morgan Stern in '44, And uh, it is... Um, called expected utility under risk. So what they added to the first marginalist is uh, the modeling of risk, the fact that the future is uncertain and that there are different possible states of the world. And uh, what we maximize is the expected utility, which is the expected, uh, which is the utility um, 
the sum of, uh, of uh, utility in each state of the world uh, times the probability that these states of the world occur. So von Neumann and, uh, and Morgenstern uh, provided an axiomatization of expected utility, which means they uh, derived the conditions, the mathematical uh, properties that are necessary and sufficient to get utility, uh, expected utility theory. Okay, so what is this? First, uh, we have to understand what is the, the domain of choice. It is lotteries. So a lottery, L, is a, 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 something that gives you the ut or the 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 um, outcome x1 with probability p1 etc the outcome xn with probability pn so you can think of it as a bet okay so uh, if you if you bet uh, that uh, switzerland will will win the next uh, world cup uh, then uh, you obtain, uh, you bet 10 euros, so you, you obtain uh, 10 uh, under the probability that uh, Switzerland wins, and uh, zero under the probability that uh, Switzerland doesn't win. And uh, the expected utility says that uh, your utility from uh, this bet is the expectation of the utility in every state of the world, which writes like this. So it is the, the sum of the probability that Switzerland wins, probably close to zero, times uh, the utility you, you, you have, you enjoy from uh, 10 euros. Okay, so this is the value you attach uh, to this bet. And uh, if I propose you, uh, maybe this value is one euro, so uh, it means that you will be indifferent between one euro or between this bet. Or said otherwise, if I uh, propose you to choose between two euros or this bet, you will prefer two euros. If I propose you to choose between uh, 50 cents and this bet, you will prefer uh, this bet because you think that uh, in expected terms, you will earn more than uh, one euro with this bet. Okay. And um, this is a, a cardinal uh, definition, right? I'm, I'm, I'm comparing um, bets with uh, values. Uh, I've used euros, but, uh, but the, the appropriate unit is utils. Um, uh, the, the important thing is that uh, I'm comparing risky uh, bets or lotteries to non-risky to sure uh, outcomes, and uh, sure outcomes are uh, have a cardinal have a cardinality. It's, it's a number, and uh, the axiomatization explains under which condition we can go from these ordinal preferences to cardinal uh, expected utility, and uh, this condition. We can call them rationality or von Neumann Morgenstern rationality. The first condition, okay, and so so yeah, so this is under these these four conditions of rationality, the theorem th says that uh, the preferences over the different options. So whether you prefer the bet or the two euros or the bet or the fifty cents, all these uh, different. Uh, one-to-one uh, -one, uh, uh, preferences can be uh, represented uh, by expected utility. It means that uh, preferring uh, the bet L to the, the lottery L to the lottery M will be equivalent to uh, having a higher utility and for L than for M. And the function U uh, is the representation of your preferences in cardinal terms. These rationality assumptions are uh, completeness that um, for any lottery 
L and M, either you prefer L or you prefer M. Uh, transitivity, that if you prefer L to M and M to N, then you prefer L to N. These two first conditions uh, define what we call in a weak order in mathematics and what economics, economists uh, call a preference relation. Then we have a continuity assumption, uh, which is uh, innocuous, which says that um, if you, you prefer uh, a lottery L to a lottery N, then uh, any lottery in between uh, M uh, you will be indifferent between M and some mixture of L and N. And uh, the important uh, axiom is the last one, it's independence. It shows that if you prefer L to M, may maybe I should explain with uh, examples. Okay, um, so let's say that um, L is a uh, you want to, you hesitate between moving to, uh, to buying a house in uh, Los Angeles, this is L, uh, in Mumbai, this is M, or in uh, Naples, this is N. Okay, um, then uh, completeness says that either uh, you prefer uh, Los Angeles to Mumbai or the contrary. Transitivity says that if you prefer uh, Los Angeles to Mumbai and Mumbai to Naples, then you prefer uh, you prefer Los Angeles to Naples. Continuity says that uh, you are indifferent between uh, moving to Mumbai or uh, some um, or going to uh, Los Angeles with some probability and uh, Naples to some probability. There is a, a probability P that makes you indifferent between the two. And indifference says that if you prefer uh, Los Angeles to Mumbai, then you will also prefer to uh, throw a coin and uh, if its head uh, go to uh, either Los Angeles or Mumbai and if its uh, tail uh, go to Naples. If you prefer uh, Los Angeles to Mumbai, you will prefer the, also the, the option where you can go to, to Mumbai uh, why, when uh, throwing the coin to the option where uh, it brings you to, uh, to Mumbai. Okay. Are there any questions? I know it's quite technical, but uh, let's read the, the, the foundation. So, um, so Gérard Debreux and, uh, and uh, Kenneth Arrow uh, proved important theorem about competitive equilibrium that are also called variation or general equilibrium. Um, because, uh, why a variation? Because it's uh, Leon Valras uh, who first um, developed uh, the model of the economy as uh, the interaction of uh, various agents where every agent pursue their own self-interest and this uh, interaction of uh, freely um, of uh, free agents ends up uh, in an equilibrium so um, so everyone is utility maximizers there are consumers work who are also workers and there are firms um, the, the, the people have endowments, so they have initial wealth and they have uh, preferences for the different goods they can buy from also the different labor they can supply. And the goal since uh, Valhas was to prove the existence, uniqueness and stability of a competitive equilibrium. And the competitive equilibrium, it's a, a price vector that equalizes consumption of each good and production of each good. So that market's clear and uh, every good that is produced is sold at the given price uh, 
that is the, the solution of uh, the equilibrium solution. So Valras just counted the number of equations to assert the existence, uh, the proof of the existence, but this would not uh, a proof, a mathematical proof, actually. Then, uh, a few years later, uh, Pareto used this theory to give uh, early versions of uh, what is now called the fundamental theorems of welfare. So under uh, some strong assumption on the way markets behave, uh, the assumptions are that markets are complete, meaning that uh, you can buy and sell any kind of good you can imagine. Agents are price taker. There is no monopoly. There is no oligopoly. Um, and there is complete and perfect information. I will explain uh, what it means in the next session. So under these restrictive conditions, the first theorem of, wealth, of welfare says that a competitive equilibrium, if it exists, will always be Pareto optimal, which means that uh, there are no uh, way to improve upon um, competitive equilibrium by changing the prices, changing uh, the, 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 the consumption and production uh, amounts of different goods so that no one is worse off and uh, at least one person uh, is better off. And the second theorem says that any Pareto optimum corresponds to some competitive equilibrium. And um, it only depends on the original endowments, so on the level of inequality somehow. So there are different Pareto uh, optimum that corresponds to different levels of, of inequality, different distribution of uh, wealth, incomes uh, between the agents. And uh, given this level of uh, endowments, of inequality, the competitive equilibrium will be optimum in the sense that no one can be made uh, better off without making someone else worse off. Uh, Arrow and, and Debreu proved the existence of the competitive equilibrium. This was a mathematical uh, problem. It was not easy uh, to solve. Actually, the mathematician, the mathematician Wald uh, gave a proof uh, in 35, but it used uh, calculus. It was a complicated proof, and uh, it made also extra assumptions. But uh, tools were developed by mathematicians in this uh, period um, that helped uh, prove this theorem much more uh, easily. Uh, these tools are fixed point theorems, and uh, the one that is used by Arrow and Debreu is due to Kakutani. So, uh, Arrow and Debreu prove the theorems uh, under their current form, and they also rely on a complete market, perfect competition, perfect and complete information. Debreu uh, later extended uh, this theorem uh, to incorporate risk and uh, made it in a version that is uh, uh, just the extension of von Neumann and Morgenstern uh, theory. And uh, in this uh, version of the competitive equilibrium, which is the, the mainstream one that uh, every economist uses nowadays, uh, the big assumption is complete markets. That markets are complete mean that there exists a market for any contingent commodity and uh, a contingent commodity which is also called an arrow de brew security is a bet. So um, for example there is a market for any kind of insurance you can imagine. Okay so you can uh, insure yourself uh, against the event of uh, an earthquake uh, where you live that destroys your, your house. You, you chose the house in Los Angeles. You can uh, buy insurance uh, against uh, an earthquake there. There is uh, also uh, a market uh, for 
an insurance against the fact that uh, you will have to move back uh, rapidly to Europe to take care of uh, your uh, sick uh, uh, parents and uh, won't have time to sell the house, so you, you need uh, an insurance for this eventuality. Uh, there is an insurance uh, available against the economic fluctuation, the fact that there will be a recession. The, so any kind of um, contingent commodity, which, is, which means any kind of uh, state of the world that you can imagine, there will exist a market for uh, our de Bruce security, so bets uh, upon this state of the world. So uh, maybe for earthquakes uh, there exist such uh, insurances, but uh, in general markets are incomplete. Uh, there are lots of uh, things you cannot insure against, and this is one of the reasons why uh, this theory uh, is not a good representation of reality. And uh, Arrow itself uh, warned against uh, the unrealism of the assumptions, and uh, it's probably uh, Arrow and Debreu were probably uh, more uh, acute in understanding uh, that their model was uh, abstract and far from reality than many uh, economists that applied it to the real world with, without checking whether uh, violating the assumptions uh, would be a problem uh, for, for the, the conclusions. Um, when I say that uh, our warns that there is no uncertainty, uh, I mean that uh, in their model the probabilities are known uh, and so are, are precise. Uh, but in reality we don't even know the probabilities of future events and that's what we called uh, Knightian uncertainty. Because uh, Frank Knight uh, wrote a book about that in the 20s. So uh, with the example I gave that uh, Switzerland wins the next World Cup, uh, we actually don't know which one, which we, we, with which probability uh, it will happen. Uh, so it's even worse than risk, it is an uncertain situation. And uh, okay, so our endeavor proved the existence and uh, they also proved uh, uniqueness and stability, but uh, they showed that uh, this requires even stronger assumption, which means that there could be multiple equilibria in principle. Are there any questions? So, this competitive equilibrium model is really um, at the origin of uh, everything that uh, we've done in the, in the previous sessions about the macro. Uh, when we talk about general equilibrium models, it's exactly this model that we are talking about. <coughs> Now, um, we have a theory for rational individual choice, okay? People uh, choose by maximizing their expected utility, but how should we take collective decisions? The Nobel Prize John Arsani tackled uh, this question and proved uh, an elegant result in favor of uh, utilitarianism. Utilitarianism here, it's utilitarianism in the, in the true meaning is taken as the sum of the utilities of everyone. This is what uh, the decision maker should maximize. What is this result? We will denote by, uh, I don't know how to call this sign, by, uh, by an index i, the preferences of individual i, and uh, without index, the social preferences the preferences of the decision maker that is a benevolent decision maker, utilitarian one. Or, at this stage we don't know yet uh, whether uh, the decision maker is utilitarian. The only assumption we make is that uh, the decision maker is rational in the sense that I've uh, just explained and that uh, they respect the unanimity principle which is also called the Pareto principle this principle says that if uh, everyone prefers L to M, then so should the decision maker. Okay, so let's say uh, you want to decide uh, altogether uh, 
where you go to holidays, whether Los Angeles or Mumbai. If everyone prefers to go to Los Angeles, then collectively you should also prefer to go to Los Angeles, uh, which seems to, to make sense. Um, and the theorem is the following. If uh, individuals are von Neumann, Morgenstern, rationals, uh, if uh, the decision maker is also rational and respect the unanimity principle, then uh, the decision, the social decision, can be represented by a function W that we call the social welfare function, which is just a weighted average of the individual utility function. Okay? Where individual i is given a uh, weight omega i. And if all individuals are given equal weight, then we recover the utilitarian social welfare function, which is just the sum of uh, everyone's uh, utility index or expected utility. Uh, there are some implicit assumptions in this model that uh, if we try to relax this assumption, uh, is, uh, it's, it's becoming a very difficult problem, and, and there is a lot of research uh, on this. The assumptions are that population is fixed. Uh, it's an issue when you have to think about all future generation with post potentially infinite population or population of different sizes uh, in function of what you do. And probabilities are known, uh, for sure. There is no uncertainty, and everyone shares the same beliefs. Uh, which is also a strong assumption. Now, um, I end the lesson with uh, an example that shows the limitation of this uh, utilitarian uh, framework. So say you have uh, two friends, Ali and Eva, uh, who wants to play a game, and they have to decide which game, either poker or chess. There are two states of the world, one and two. And, uh, you know, poker is quite random, and they have the same level in poker. So uh, in state one, uh, which occurs with probability one half, uh, Eva wins if they play poker. In state two, uh, which also occurs with probability one half, Ali wins uh, if uh, they play poker. And uh, the winner, uh, I mean, they like to win. So when um, one wins, they have uh, the outcome one, one util, and when one loses, they have uh, zero utils. So if uh, they play poker, uh, the expected utility of Ali uh, at the moment of the decision is 1.5, because they don't know yet in which state they are. Uh, so it's equally probable. Uh, and the expected utility of Eva is the same, 1.5. OK? Now, uh, Eva is better than Ali at chess. So whatever the state of the world, Eva will win. And uh, will be happy, even, know, even though uh, they know uh, that, uh, that Eva will win. She, she, she is still uh, happier after having played. And Ali uh, will, will be uh, less happy. Oh, I've, <laughs> I've inverted. Uh, sorry. It's, uh, of course, the expected utility of Eva is 1 here and Ali uh, 0. Uh, and. Um, so, um, so now, imagine that they want to take the decision uh, impartially, or they, they ask uh, uh, some, someone else to take the decision impartially which game they, sh they should play. Uh, according to Arsani, uh, what you should do is you should take the, the, the option with the higher uh, social welfare, which is the sum of uh, um, individual utility. So here, uh, it will be 1, the sum of 1.5 plus 1.5. And here, it will also be 1. So according to Arsani, uh, you are indifferent uh, between chess and poker. Uh, in any case, there will be one winner and one loser. Uh, and so the, the expected utility is the same. But the thing is that uh, if you are uh, egalitarian, if you want the equality of opportunity, then they should play poker rather than chess. Because uh, with poker, the minimum utility that uh, each one will get is one half. Whether with chess, one will be unhappy and one will be happy. 
And um, another way to aggregate uh, individual preferences into uh, social uh, preferences is to maximize the minimum of the expected utility of uh, all people, which in this case uh, leads to choose poker. Okay, max min is the decision rule advocated by John Rawls uh, in the Theory of Justice, uh, which is the, the mainstream uh, ethics in philosophy uh, nowadays. But probably not for the max min. Uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's well known, uh, probably not for the max min, for other things. But anyway, uh, this is an, another uh, way um, on which we could base uh, social um, choice. So, um, why does Arsani obtain this result even though it, uh, it's not necessarily intuitive? I mean, uh, the, the unanimity principle seems to make sense, rationality assumption seems to make sense. Actually, the crucial assumption was independence in the assumption of uh, rationality. This is the one that uh, make uh, Arsani indifferent between poker and chess. And uh, why? Because um, the independence assumption is an assumption of separation. I really have a lot of uh, issues uh, today. Uh, it's shutting down. don't know what to do. Okay, but I think I can just uh, finish um, already. So the, the independence uh, axiom is uh, an axiom that uh, separates um, the, um, the, the different state of the world and the different individuals. And that uh, the, the, the good way to understand it is the veil of ignorance. So the idea of Arsani is that if you are impartial, you should uh, take the decision as if you are under a veil of ignorance. So you don't know which state of the world will occur and you don't know who you will be. And, uh, and in this case, there is a, a probability uh, one fourth to be in uh, each of the, of the four different cases. And, uh, and because you don't know if you are Ali or Eva, uh, you, are a, you are indifferent between the two options because in any case, uh, either you win or you lose with equal probability. And uh, if um, you want to, to model the equality of opportunity, you want to uh, break the separation uh, between, or you want to make an asymmetry uh, between separating state of the world and separating people. You want to, to say uh, that you, maybe under a veil of ignorance, you don't know whether you will be Ali and Eva in the first stage, but then you first know whether you are Ali or Eva, and then in the second stage, you know in which state of the world you are. And you want to maximize uh, from the point of view of the expected utility of each agent. Um, and then they don't have the same expected utility. So uh, you can care about equality of opportunity and, uh, and prefer uh, poker. And um, yeah, so, so this, uh, this crucial assumption of independence uh, is, uh, is relaxed in, uh, in more recent uh, research. And uh, it yeah, and, and so um, dropping it opens many ways of aggregating uh, individual preferences into social preferences and leaves the question open how to aggregate individual preferences. And uh, we will see next week uh, more uh, work on this by uh, Kenneth uh, Arrow. Thank you. <laughs>